right, we're going to be getting in just one more minute. Anybody in the lobby, please come back, including our last speaker who is still in the lobby. <laughs> There she is, okay. All right, uh, Jean, if you'll sit down, we'll start. There you go. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming back into the room. And uh, as soon as I have your attention, I'll introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Reddy. Uh, as I mentioned, is an alum of GSO. While he was uh, a student here in chemical, chemical oceanography, uh, he had the good fortune of a major oil spill occurring just down the road, the, uh, the North Cape and Scandia case I mentioned that uh, I actually worked on with Sheldon to help, uh, help prosecute. Uh, so uh, Chris did his doctoral research on a spill just down the road and uh, has been at Woods Hole for some number of years and specializing in oil spills. And when this spill happened, became one of the first scientists to actually uh, go in and get involved in an NSF-sponsored cruise uh, using some emergency uh, uh, quick response funds from the National Science Foundation, um, used an ROV, which uh, is one of very few like it in, in the world he'll tell you about that could actually sniff underwater plumes of oil. Uh, and then uh, after this incredible trip at sea, uh, became the uh, first uh, scientist to publish a major article on the subject of the fate of those underwater plumes in, in Science Magazine, the highest uh, honor anybody in the academic world can have. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce and welcome back to GSO, Dr. Chris Reddy. Chris? So thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I, I had a wonderful uh, four years here when I was a graduate student here, and I'm happy to be back. Um, as I usually say when I'm in Rhode Island, I'm a native of Rhode Island, educated all the way up, Cranston East, Rhode Island College, URI. No better buck out there spent than the education of uh, Rhode Island, so we should be all proud of that. Um, the one thing that we have to remember, I'm going to talk about spills, is, and this has been hinted by a lot of my pre pre uh, pre -speak previous speakers, is that we have, in television and the press, um, uh, essentially programmed people to think that this, is, uh, this oil spill was like a court case or like uh, the television show CSI. And that, that's just not the case, okay? Nothing's going to happen in eight seconds. We're never going to have 100% accuracy, 100% certainty. And not one single person is going to be able to tell how somebody died and then how long the car went before its brakes went out, okay? It's going to take time and team and patience, okay? That oil spill budget that um, Dennis put up earlier, and I think Malcolm as well, the analog to that from the Exxon Valdez, 10.8 million gallons, took five years to put together. Okay, so we have some patience. Right now, we are just the beginning of understanding the science of the spill. This is a tease. Okay, so just remember that. Hang in there. I'm going to talk about work from June, two weeks. So in a little part of the of the Gulf. So, so we have to remember. I, I'm not an expert on the whole Gulf for the whole. You know, time it happened. And that's what you have to remember about all these things, these scientists who are blogging, fantail press conferences, all of this stuff. Just one little points in time, or maybe small points in time, okay? When this spill occurred, I had just uh, earlier, maybe a year earlier, was at a conference with most of the players in oil spill science. And you know what we talked about the whole time? Arctic oil spills or biofuel spills. Never, ever talked about the Gulf of Mexico. Every person who's probably been involved in that spill, there's about 150 of us, one or another, all we talked about that. The Gulf of Mexico, I went back and read the transcript for the two and a half days, the Gulf of Mexico was never brought up. So this kind of underscores what we've been hearing from Admiral Landry, from Dennis, as well as everybody else, that this was a, a kind of new in that respect. So let's see, I'm not very talented in this case. Pointed up where? Okay, 
I had a really busy summer, and it's funny because I was really wanting to get out of oil spills. I felt like Michael Corleone in Godfather 3. I've been trying to get out of oil spills, and yet I got pulled back in. And uh, that's okay because you as um, taxpayers have funded me to do this work, so it's okay. I've been doing some uh, uh, um, coastal field work. I had a little thing to do with some other uh, flow measurements. Uh, I don't want to get involved with Peter's wrong side, so I'm just going to just hint at that. Uh, we, we had outstanding support from the Endeavor all the way down. Don't tell anybody, but I think the Endeavor is better than Oceanus, which is the single sister ship to Huey. Um, and I've been busy writing a lot of op-eds. I've had the opportunity to speak to Congress. I've had the opportunity to speak to the National Commission. And last, I was an academic liaison at the Unified Area Command that um, Admiral Landry hinted at. I cannot underscore to you that the, one of the biggest problems with the United States is they have absolutely terrible PR. They do not show how much good work and how many talented people are out there, including BP at my pay raise scale, okay? You, if you ever went to this Unified Area Command and see these people working and how hard they are and how smart these people are, it would have blown your mind. And I wish people, more people saw this. And I hats off to NOAA, EPA, the, the Coast Guard. I mean, just you can't stop seeing all these people. I was up, I had the opportunity to work with several admirals, Admiral Zunkoff and Admiral Nash uh, when I was down there, spectacular leaders. And uh, we're lucky to have these people. Oh, other way, good, good, good. I dabble in oil spills, um, trying to get out of some of them, started working 1969 spills. I got trying to tie up loose ends in South Korea. Um, of particular interest in my case in this spill is these natural oil seeps uh, have project active projects off the coast of Santa Barbara and as well as off the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico. So, um, so it was an interesting opportunity when we got into the Gulf because we've been working on natural seeps there as well. Um, when you go to oil spills, usually this is the basic scenario. I'm going to be a little tongue in cheek. Um, one helicopter, one CNN, one politician saying, I'm going to make them pay, and maybe 10 or 20 guys in the Gumby suits picking up the oil-covered stuff. Now, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek. And then if you're on a boat, you know you're in an oil spill because the sea surface gets dampened by the oil, and then you start to smell it. And that, that's basically you think you're at an oil spill, and you know you're at an oil spill. When we were out there, and this was about a mile away on the, in the Endeavor in the last week of June, there was a little bit more going on. Bob, can you make that go? So this is about a mile away. This is they had they had put on a riser pipe, and um, there was a lot of boats. There were two boats that were burning off oil that was collected on this mini top hat. There was people talking, but the background side on top of the wind is the jet from those two flames. So you got a whole new sense of sensory overload. You got a lot more boats. You got flames. You've got lots. It, it was insane and. And the people who were on that boat probably took 5,000 pictures on the first day. It was, it was amazing in that respect. Unfortunately, um, I was had the opportunity to um, to get on another boat from the Endeavor to collect some sample of oil coming right out of the broken riser pipe. So it was an um, so I went from the Endeavor to a fast boat to a boat called the Ocean Intervention Three, which was operated by BP. And we cut a deal with them, and they let us do it to let us collect a real sample of oil coming right out of the rise of pipe. And the interesting aspect was we got on this Ocean Intervention 3 about when it was about three miles away from essentially, let's say, ground zero, for back of, lack of a better term. We went to a conference room. About three hours later, we walked onto the deck. Bob, can you cue this up? This is what we saw, felt, heard. <laughs> burning off some oil. We were setting up to put some devices on an ROV, which my colleague Rich Kennelly, he's the smart one on my team. And then that is the Discover Enterprise. So you saw two flames on the New York Times. Those are the ones that you were right in the middle of it. You had to have two sets of hearing protection. Uh, it was the most surreal thing that I've ever done in my life. You could, if you were too close, you could actually uh, feel the heat on your arms. I took this all off my, my uh, black belt. So, uh, and this ROV is huge. I mean, this is a world class ROV. The guys who run this oceanary, the CA saw their name at the bottom uh, on CNN, uh, they were outstanding. Okay, so, uh, okay, 
now you can stop that. So what we were curious about was trying to get a perfect sample of oil coming out of the rise of pipe because we want to know how much gas and how much oil was in there. We also wanted the most perfect end member of oil, like that, the, you know, when you're in a crime scene, you want that, the, the, the blood from the person who was, you know, that, uh, yeah, you want the, the end member. You want that beginning oil because it's great for fingerprinting. So we put this device that was used to collect hydrothermal vent oils, hot water, and it keeps things under pressure. We put it on our ROV, and uh, we go ahead and cue it up. So this is high def video of us going down. Oh, do I need to go? Thanks. So this is an ROV that uh, the 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 right at the bottom of the arm is this uh, kind of little bomb that's allowed to collect. You can go ahead and cue it up, Bob. And uh, we're sitting in this boat. Um, and telling the ROV pilot where we want this uh, snorkel, you can see, tell it to put it in there, and we want to go right into there. Uh, at that point, it was 100 degrees Celsius. We had a thermometer right on the end of that. We put it in there, we held it there, and um, we held it there, and we collected the sample, and uh, we collected a few of them. And, uh, the, but it was a pretty spectacular. Uh, we did this in eight hours, and uh, it was a pretty spectacular night. Um, so we'll stop right there, Bob. So, um, so, okay, we were curious about subsurface plumes. Okay, I'm not curious about mass balance, whether NOAA was right, uh, who's wrong, University of Georgia dispersants. We just wanted to know whether or not what people were saying that they were do subsurface plumes existed. That was the goal of our research project. It was quite modest, but certainly non-trivial. Okay, there was a lot going out on there about that. So, simple. Two plumes exist. Can we know what their size and shape and what's the chemical composition? Can we understand maybe down the road when we have a lot of data why these plumes started? I mean, shouldn't oil go up? Why did it take a right hand turn? Um, very simple. We just wanted to know that. Um, sorry. We had a little info. My friends and I have been working on this and we had um, some video. The, 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 my colleagues asked for video, but they only asked for video from right at the spot where oil was coming out. We were able to get the video all the way up and down. This is the HD video that points that something was going on around 1,100 or 1,200 meters. This was in June. We wrote a proposal, got out on the Endeavor in the middle of June. Unbelievable heroic effort to turn this boat around, get it from Narragansett to Tampa. I can't say enough. That's Dave Nelson right there. I think the finest technician I've ever sailed with. Um, and we're lowering a, what we call a rosette. It allows us to collect data with sensors that allows you to how much oil is in the water, as well as collect discrete samples. It's not particularly efficient because you have to go around and stab. Okay, It's a big gulf. Stabbing takes a long time. This is why. The uncertainty, which has been talked a lot about here, is going to be big from this spill. Anybody says that 56.934% of something went somewhere is way off. It's going to be a big, there's going to be some uncertainty. Okay, so we were collecting water samples with this rosette. Okay, um, this foolish thing. Um, we did something called toyoing. Now, this is off the coast of Hawaii, but it's the best graphic. You take the rosette, you let it all the way out, and instead of point in, you drive and go up and down, up and down. And it allows you to collect a lot of data uh, in a fast amount of time with your sensor packages. This was a non-trivial thing because we had to let this out 5,000 feet and let 5,000 feet be laid out while the boat was driving around in a circle. The captain was incredibly courageous and Dave Nelson was very confident that we could pull this off. I don't think many captains would have let us do this. Um, it was safe, it was okay, but this was a non-trivial thing. What we did was, um, and then with the last thing in our asset was a vehicle that you just threw over the side, had a, had a, a, a what we call a mass spectrometer that could smell for oil, and just say, look, go find oil. But we needed the help to get in the right place. I'm gonna. This is what they call an automated identification system. This tells you all the boats that were out there. This was challenging. 
trying to do research with all the every one of those yellows was a boat you know and our skipper had to worry about all those boats out there and when we had a lot five thousand feet of wire out there that was a huge challenge we did a we 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 went around and did a big circle with the toyo when we did that, we found out, so we went, we drove around in a whole circle, it took us almost 24 hours, and we said, you know what, the only place that we find something interesting is around 1,100 meters or 3,300 feet going southwest from the plume. And um, so with that blue circle is what we, when we did that Toyo, we drove around in a circle for 22 hours going up and down, up and down, up and down. Then we told Sentry to go to work. And we said, Sentry, go down at 1,100 meters, and just start looking. And when you find something um, and you, you can't see any more oil, turn, about, turn around and, and start again. So we just let it go do its work. So we threw Sentry over the water. We brought it back up. This is what Sentry found. So we said, hey, go over 1,100 meters. Bob, can you keep me up? Thanks. And uh, we threw it over the side, put it at 1,100 meters, and said, go. And this has a sensor package in it that can smell for oil. So here comes Sentry. It's coming along. It started driving. And this is where it started to detect oil. And it followed. And uh, what we could do is, as we could start telling it to not go as far out. See how it was turning a lot quicker? Because we knew that we didn't need to waste all that time um, for it to go. Now we started to play around here and try to do some other experiments. And then a hurricane came. So we were only going to be able to go out about 22 miles. But that's what the plume looked like in three-dimensional space. Um, it had a, was moving at about 7 centimeters a second. And uh, that's an important. We wanted to know its size. We wanted to know its shape. We wanted to know what it looks like. So when we start, with, start to work with smart people like Malcolm, we'll all work together. Because it's a team effort. One person is not going to solve all these problems. Wait. How do I move forward? Uh, oh, yes. So uh, anyways, that's what it looks like. That black area is, is what the plume looked like. Everybody wants to know, oh my god, we have a plume. It's, it's a river of death, Hershey syrup. That's what it is. It was clear water. Doesn't mean that it wasn't toxic. Just means that it wasn't black death. At This was about 15 miles away. Now, I have to be honest with you. I haven't finished doing all my analyses, so I only know a little bit about this oil. And this oil in this, and in this water, there's definitely oil as our sensor package has said so. We're working as, as we speak. What we can tell you is, is from our data so far, that that plume could not have come from every natural seep that exists in the Gulf of Mexico. If the greatest plumber in the world plumbed all the seeps together and put it in one spot right next to the broken riser pipe and said, come and make a plume, it couldn't do it. So we could prove that a plume existed and it couldn't be supported by the Gulf of Mexico. I mean by natural seeps. This is what we provided. We had a big press conference. It was great. Everybody, I was really, I was smart. Everybody looked good. And uh, let me tell you, I mean, I probably given a lot of press interviews in the last 10 or 15 years. After this press conference, it's been really hard. This is what we gave, and these are the things that you would see afterwards. River of oil. So people were taking our figures. This is hard stuff. It's really hard to try to, you know, keep your science in line, but without going crazy. And you know, this is our life. You know, trying to have balance. You know, the, there are some aspects of the press that believe, and if it bleeds, it leads. There are other good science journalists that are otherwise. And then you cannot compete with blogs. You'll never compete with a blog. So just simply, you know, basic science, you know, we, we found a continuous coherent plume only in June. Uh, we hope that it helps to understand plume formation, and uh, it couldn't come from natural seeps. I, I have a lot of other projects, but I just wanted to keep to something simple. Last thing, Dennis. You know, you guys think that this oil spill and all, the, all these speakers are, is, you know, no knock on any of them. But at the end of the day, you or I should be thanking Jim Quinn, um, who's somewhere up here. Um, all his students are in the Gulf, <laughs> you know, like, or have some role in the Gulf, or have published papers about oil spills, or have done something, or or the lead scientist on the Ixchak. Um, you know, he's always played a low role. Where are you? I'm going to embarrass Professor you. Professor Quinn, take it. I'm going to embarrass him. <laughs> this, you guys, you guys just. 
really don't quite understand uh, his impact in oil spill science and his footprint that exists all over this country. You can't go and talk to somebody unless they say, oh, I read a Farrington paper, I read a Paul Bowen paper, I read, Greg Douglas said this, Terry Wade said this, and you're like, yep, academic brother, yep, academic, Jim student, Jim student, Jim student, Jim student. So we should all thank Jim for uh, setting a stage and putting a lot of talented people out there. Thank you. Chris mentioned he kept running into quinomes wherever he went in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, David Smith, uh, who will talk about his work on the very small critters that live on the bottom of the ocean and how they react to oil. David. OK, thank you. Uh, for the past 20 years or so, I've had uh, opportunity to do research on both uh, bacteria that live in the deep sea, and so looking at, uh, not, not in context of oil spills, but just how they uh, perform in the deep sea. And I've also done some work with the Naval Research Lab on degradation of fuel contaminants in, in sediments. And so with that background there, I was asked to uh, share my ideas on, on this one particular aspect of the uh, deep water horizon oil spill, and that was the use of dispersants. Bob? Uh, thanks. So, the dispersants are, are one tool that managers have uh, available to them, and, and the idea here is that uh, this happens after the spill. The oil is already in the water, and now the decision is made as to whether we want to try and influence where that oil goes. And the way these work is uh, the dispersants are detergents that break up the uh, oil into small droplets, and then uh, then they can become entrained in the in the uh, water column. Now, this is these these decisions are made usually based on what's called environmental trade-offs. Do we want to uh, value one resource over another? Do we want to protect a shoreline, basically, protect a shoreline at the expense of the water column? Okay, and so that's when these decisions are made. Uh, Bob, can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> now, their use is very controversial, and, and there's, there's some good reasons for the controversies and some, some not so good. Uh, the, the, the first one, and probably the major one, is, is the, you have to keep in mind that the dispersants do not remove the oil. They just move it from one place to another. And so some people think all the effort should be put on removing the oil as opposed to dispersing it. Uh, there are certainly concerns about uh, toxicity. Uh, these are uh, some historical uh, baggage there. The, the first time detergents were used was in a, uh, the Torrey Canyon spill in uh, 1967 off the coast of the UK. And in the final analysis, the detergents that were used at the time were, in fact, uh, worse than just leaving the oil as is. And so this sort of baggage has carried on, but uh, uh, the th dispersants are much different today. And then uh, the third category of this is that there's a concern that the, the dispersants just uh, hide the problem, right? So you're removing it from the shoreline where it's very easy to see. Certainly those pictures of the oil-soaked gulls are, are, are very compelling and really require no caption to really stress the, uh, uh, the, the problem, the problem at the shoreline. And so some are concerned that this, by dispersing the oil and moving it into the, into the water column, you're basically hiding the, pro program, uh, the problem and minimizing the impact and, and basically minimizing the, the public uproar on that. Now that, that figure there shows a, um, an aircraft, a fixed wing aircraft, to, 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 uh, deploying the dispersants over a spill, and this is the usual mode that this happens. The oil comes to the surface, and uh, if the oil's fresh enough and, and can be dispersed with the dispersants, this thing comes in like a crop duster or helicopters, and, and de uh, deploys the dispersants right at the uh, surface of the uh, sea surface. So, Bob, if I can have the next one. What was very different about the Deepwater Horizon spill was that the dispersants were injected right at the wellhead. Now, you've seen these figures before, uh, in Peter's presentation, and now what's what's happening here is if you see that bar, it's going here. The dispersant is being added directly to the oil as it's exiting the the wellhead, and this this is uh, this was un unprecedented. Uh, now there's some things as you look at that, as you see the uh, the ability to add the dispersant right at the wellhead in this vigorous mixing here. You see the gas coming out in this uh, this. Uh, uh, turbulent nature here, you can actually get a nice mixing of the dispersant right at the at the wellhead there. 
Uh, the question then is, you know, was this a good idea? It's, it's my understanding that this idea came up during the time of the crisis. The, wa the oil is coming out. What are we going to do? And this was, an, this was an idea that came up. And so um, going forward, I'd like to really explore whether this was a good idea or actually find out whether it's a good idea. Uh, Bob? So Chris just showed you this plume of, of oil down there. And one scenario that, that goes on is that Bacteria, some bacteria are, are very well adapted to use oil as a, as a food source. The, the Gulf of Mexico has natural seeps of oil and there are indigenous populations of bacteria that are evolved to consume oil. And it's a very reasonable idea, at least in my mind, is that this influx of oil here should stimulate their growth. Now that growth of that population should come at the expense of some other, some other bacteria that, that are not tolerant of the, bac, uh, of the oil. But those that can consume the oil as a food source are now uh, enjoying a, um, a, a great advantage. Well, so this video here has a drop of oil being placed into, this was taken through a microscope, so these are small droplets that it's a, uh, it'll, it'll loop through here. There's a, uh, a drop of oil put into a, a water that has a dispersant in it. And you see that what's happening is that that oil droplet breaks up into small, uh, small droplets. And how this could actually play out in helping the degradation of the uh, oil in place is that it provides more surface area for the bacterium to attach to the oil droplet and actually degrade it. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the problems that, that are uh, inherent here is that this picture on the right is a very well-known bacterium um, that degrades oil. And in fact, in this figure here, the inside of that, there's, you see a bunch of cells. On the inside here is actually oil, and here's a water phase. And these bacteria are attached to this droplet, and they're degrading the oil. And the, the use of the dispersant will make more surface area for the, for the uh, uh, bacteria to work on. Now, the concerns are, uh, so we know all about this bacterium. We have the entire genome is sequenced, and, and we know uh, quite a bit about its behavior. The problem is what, what this bacterium lives at the surface. It lives in warm water at the surface. It lives in the ocean. Uh, that's not the conditions in which the oil is, is, has been dispersed. And I'm, I'm speaking directly to the uh, river, uh, the, the plume that uh, Chris just showed you. And, and so what you have to do is think about maybe not this particular bacterium, but the bacteria that are down there that are capable of degrading the oil is what, what, kind of, what kind of conditions do they have? And, and if you look at it from the environmental conditions, some are actually may enhance the, uh, the degradation. Uh, there's enough oxygen down in the, in the, in the bottom of the Gulf to uh, support the uh, consumption of this. The bacteria will consume the oil at the expense of oxygen, just like you do when you, you eat uh, food. Uh, one downside of that, though, is, is replenishing that oxygen at depth is, is uh, is very problematic. The other thing is there's a lot of nutrients down there. Some of the things that had happened in the past, like up in Prince William Sound, um, they've sprayed fertilizer on there trying to en enhance this decomposition uh, because the, the bacteria do not live on just the oil alone, but they need uh, other nutrients. And in the deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, there's plenty of nutrients to support this. Now on the other side, the water in the, in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico is cold. Uh, right at the wellhead, it's about the same temperature as your, uh, that you have as in your refrigerator at home. And you, we keep our food in the refrigerator because it slows down the metabolism and reduces the spoilage of the food. So you're, you're slowing down the microbial growth on, on the food by lowering the temperature. Well, this is, this is the temperature that they're facing here in, in the, uh, in the uh, deep, deep water in the Gulf. And so that's going to play against it. And the other thing is the high pressure. And that's just a wild card. We don't know much about uh, the uh, decomposition of the oil at the, uh, at high pressure. Uh, Bob, can I have the next slide, please? So w what I really want to stress here is that a decision was made in a time of crisis to deploy the dispersants at, at depth. Uh, what, what I would like to see is that we commit the resources to follow up on this and look at what are the long-term consequences, the long-term environmental consequences of, of this decision that we made. And mostly so, uh, we are continuing to extract oil from further offshore, which means deeper. Uh, there is going to be another spill in the future. And 
what I hope is that we can learn from this experience, that we commit the resources to continue the research, not, not after the shoreline's cleaned up and, and people move on to another problem, but uh, for the next uh, coming years to actually follow up on this and see what the implications of, of doing this. It might, it might have been a great idea, and maybe that's the way we do it in the future. Or maybe it didn't work out as, as well as we thought. But it, what I would like to do is, is for the next spill is actually to be making these decisions based on some sound scientific data as opposed to just, uh, well, let's try this. We're, we're in a crisis mode. So thank you. Thank you, David. It's now my uh, pleasure to welcome back to uh, GSO, Professor of Oceanography and Ocean Engineering and Associate Dean, Kate Moran. Kate, with that unique perspective from the White House. Well, thanks. It's really great to be back. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm actually thrilled to be here with um, colleagues who I'm proud to say, come from here and have made major contributions to this uh, big natural disaster, or natural disaster uh, combined with the engineering failure. Um, I'd just like to start off by just mentioning a little bit about me in a little more detail. Um, I was, I've been in Washington now for a year working at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and this office is led by the President's Science Advisor, Dr. John Holdren. And I went there basically to provide guidance on oceans, climate change, and polar regions because some of my research has been focused on the Arctic Ocean. And after April 20th, um, I s we're, we're directed to provide guidance and, and begin to investigate issues important to the nation. I started writing one paragraph memos up the chain saying, hmm, I wonder why they're doing this at the wellhead and wouldn't it be interesting to do that? And um, after Dr. Holdren started to notice that I knew the difference between a blowout preventer and casing, <laughs> he invited me to participate with Secretary Chu's science team. And so what I'm going to talk with to today about is a little bit about that experience, because Dennis asked me this to really speak about lessons learned and how can we do this better in the future. But I'm going to focus on that aspect um, because of a lot of things that have been talked about here today. And one of them was that we didn't see this coming. And I'm going to come back to this in, in my slides. And I would argue that some, in every technical issue, there's usually a small group of people that see it coming. And in the late 1990s, the oil industry be, hit, a, hit a technical boundary where they were challenged by drilling in very deep water. And there's not enough time to describe why that, that's a big challenge but I'd be happy to answer questions later. But when you get to deeper than about 1,500 meters, it's a different situation. The actual well is extremely complicated. So as I began to express these, these concerns, they became incorporated into the discussions that were happening with Secretary Chu's science team. And that also leads me to this concept that people have been saying that this was a low probability, high in, impact event. And I would argue that because of the fact that we are in a different kind of technical regime in deep water drilling, it is probably not a low probability event. And that has implications to how we move forward in a regulatory framework in the future. And the other thing that I think is clear from all of the, um, the discussions today, that we have at least, at least, I'll say half of the oil still remaining in the Gulf in some way, shape, or form. It could be becoming eaten up, but that's a considerable amount of, of, of oil, no matter how you measure it. So could you take the next slide, please? Just to give you an overview of, of, the, of the oil issue, um, the, the, this, this oil from Deepwater Gulf of Mexico, I won't go through the bullets, those first three, but basically it's providing about 70% of the domestic oil in the United States. So this is not a trivial oil province for the country, as most of you know. But as I mentioned, deep water is challenging, and it's a real technical challenge because of the small sp pressure gradients, and I can tell you the details of that, but they're very, very small pressure gradients for which the oil industry has to work in these deep water environments. The systems are complex. The oil forms hydrates. It's, it's a solid ice that forms at these water depths. 
and, and forms wax formations. And these deep ROVs have to, have to work, do all the work on the seafloor. You can't use any, any, any uh, actual diving kind of systems. All of the materials have to be higher strength because of these pressures. And the whole systems are incredibly complex. Um, I'd like to just, you know, you've all seen the pictures of the BOP in the newspaper, right? You've seen the images that the BOPs are as tall as this building. The vessels that are used to deploy these and drill from them, the main deck is twice as high as this building. So these are massive kind of systems that are incredibly complicated. Next slide. So you've seen this picture before. That's the uh, um, Deepwater Horizon on location. Next slide. And this is the, you've seen this before from Admiral Landry, uh, where they, they began to fight the fire. And I show this one in the next slide, Bob, because there's one aspect of, uh, that I wanted to mention. I, don't, I won't speak long about it, but there's one aspect of the um, actual event that hasn't been mentioned that much. And there's an there's a important disconnect called the emergency disconnect, where you're actually re you disconnect the riser from the wellhead. And that actually failed as well. It could, would not have saved the 11 lives that were lost, but if that had been disconnected, there might have been a much better chance of the rig actually moving off location and actually being the fire being put out. So, so the, there's other aspects that have not been focused on that we'll, we'll be hearing about as these commissions that get completed. Next slide, Bob. And go, go ahead. So what I'd like to do is um, basically go through some of, the, some of the aspects that I worked on in a, in a very detailed way. Just to recap, there were teams working on different aspects of the, of the spill. I worked on a team that was trying to cap the well. And that was led by Secretary Chu, who provided advice directly to Admiral Allen. And there were other teams. Obviously, you've heard them already. There was a cleanup uh, and, the, and the response team on the water and on the shoreline. And there's also now a team that's been stood up, as Malcolm mentioned, to really look at what are the long-term impacts, where is the oil going, what are the long-term impacts, and what do we need to restore the Gulf. But I'm going to focus on these. And um, they're, they're, they're just, I'll, t I'll go through them fairly quickly because of time, but I'll just highlight some of the things that I think are going to help us with lessons learned. So we started with the, the relief well started in early May. The top kill, as you heard, was tried at the end of the May and failed. The capping stack was installed in all these terms. Uh, there's different capping stacks were capping stacks were installed. The the static kill was completed in early August, and the BOP changeout completed fairly recently. With the final step, the relief well intersect completed just a few weeks ago. Next slide. So continue, Bob. Thanks. So I'm going to step through these. I'll just say okay. Is that all right, Bob? So um, this is I'm going to use this background where there's a little calendar there on the left that tells you what some some of the events now on the right is I'm not going to show this any longer this this uh, this key so you'll see that the estimated oil spill, spill area the dark blue will be heavy oil light blue and uh, uh, less heavy oil and then beached oil will be red along the shore not to be confused with the critical habitat shown on the coastline and on, in red in this text are are the decisions the, that were made by the government to allow BP to move forward on all the activities at the wellhead. So next slide. At, at, um, the, the estimated uh, flow, as you just saw, was 1,000 uh, barrels per day. And Peter described that in great detail and, and quite accurately, um, except for the fact that there was the 8,000 barrels a day had not been flowing from the well initially. But other than that, the, the, estimate, the, the, the values were correct. Um, on April 28th, the, the, the U.S. Coast Guard revised the leak estimate at 5,000 barrels per day. And on that day, Secretary Chu established an external science team. That's a team that I joined s about three or four weeks later. And that's a team that actually provided the guidance in Houston for BP to move forward on, on all these aspects of the wellhead. Okay. Uh, Secretary Napolitano named Admiral Allen an incident commander. and. In early May, the first uh, relief well began, and it just took time. That was very, very quick. It just took time to mobilize a drill ship to get there to begin to drill a, a relief well. OK. Um, the, the BP was able to put a first successful top hat on about May 12th, 12th, and it was in that broken part where a lot of the oil was coming out of. And they, um, they brought the enterprise in uh, at a place with a, with a riser pipe on May 12th. Okay. 
This is just a picture from uh, actually a BP picture showing you the, what that top hat, hat looked like on that broken pipe. And that's where you started to be, begin to recover oil to the surface to, to the um, enterprise drill ship. OK. Then the BP's uh, contracted the de development driller two to begin to drill the second relief well. And I, I have this in red because it was the science team's assessment that given the history of Ixtoc where at least two relief wells were required to stop that well. It was it was prudent for the government to insist that, B, that BP move forward with a second relief well in case the first had issues and problems. And it was at that time that that straw that Peter mentioned in his talk was inserted into the riser to begin to suck more oil uh, and recover it and contain it. Okay. And this is a picture, a diagram just showing you the the, the straw that was stuck into the end of the of the of the drill of the uh, riser pipe to actually collect that oil. Okay. Um, at the end of May, the BP had proposed to try top kill operations, where they're actually trying to pump heavy fluids into the top of the wellhead through the broken bl blowout preventer. And after several days, it was the the review by the science team and with BP's agreement, they halted operations because it was not not successful. And it was at this stage that. It was clear that the ultimate capping or stopping of the flow would have to ultimately rely uh, heavily on the relief wells, which were going to take several months. And so BP focused much of its efforts after this into improving the containment of the oil coming out of the wellhead. OK. And so this is where they actually brought in more vessels uh, to actually begin to collect this oil. Now, one of the things that was that has been mentioned is why didn't they have enough vessels? And these are really large vessels that have come from all other places in the world. And so it was really the timing of trying to get vessels into the Gulf. It wasn't the fact that BP did not want to bring them in. So the, the work began early to try to bring in vessels that could con to actually capture all of this oil. It is a considerable amount of oil. Okay. And so that, that's when they began to bring in additional vessels to capture the oil from the top cap, OK? And it was clear then that this idea of the top kill uh, obviously wasn't working and that, that, that they had to actually do something to capture the oil right from the blowout preventer. And so work, work began to um, cut off that broken riser pipe so that a better top cap could be placed on the wellhead in order to, to increase the, the, the oil uh, recovered, OK? And so this is what was done. Um, there was a, a, a top. They were actually designed two different top caps to be based on what, how well the cutting of the riser pipe would, would work. And um, the, the, one of the top caps was deployed. And as you can see in this lower right, they, they still didn't capture all of it. So they continued to. Um, uh, inject dispersants and also to inject uh, a, an inhibitor for hydrate formation uh, as they were recovering covering the oil. So this was a big step. The containment began to increase. And it also became a big issue. What do you do with the, all the oil? They had to have the ships to, con to capture it. They were burning as much as they could. Um, and as you saw from the uh, AIS uh, diagram in Chris's talk, it was an incredible number of vessels in a very small area working. I'll show you that later. Uh, next. And so this is what uh, what they also did to capture more, more oil, was bringing it not only up to the Enterprise drill ship, but also the Q4000. And you, you saw the, the, the actual burning from, the, from those vessels in, in, in that fantastic video that Chris showed. Uh, OK. Then the government flow rate estimates were updated to 35,000 to 60,000 barrels per day. And this was a work in progress. And I just wanted to comment that there was a, initially the, the Everything, the decisions were being made as best they could, and the focus of, of all this work was trying to cap the well and trying to protect the shoreline and collect as much oil as possible. And so in many ways, it really did not matter if the oil was 35,000 or 5,000 barrels per day, because as Admiral Landry had mentioned, what the, what the government was doing is mobilizing to the maximum possible, even though that was a, a gigantic um, uh, effort. I think one of the lessons learned from, from my perspective is that one of the things that would have been a little bit, uh, maybe a different approach, would have been to say to BP, you wrote in your report, in your, in your actual um, proposal to drill here, that the, the worst case would be 162,000 barrels per day. 
And one of the things that we could have done is to say to BP, it's 162,000 barrels per day, make some measurements to demonstrate that it's less than that. It's just a different way to think about the approach to the, to the issue. Um, OK. Um, so BP completed the installation of the freestanding riser for a third ship uh, to, to collect oil because we were collecting more and more oil as that estimate. And it was clear the oil was, was uh, quite a bit different than 5,000 barrels per day. OK. And that they brought in a third vessel, the Helix Producer, to collect more oil in, in early July. OK. And they, the B began, BP began the process of installing that the, the very new capping stack, which is different than the top hat, if you can recall. Next slide. And this is what it looked like. It was basically to take off the, the very broken part of the upper part of the blowout preventer. And they built this new system. And the key thing here was that at the very bottom, you'll see these big bolts. And one of the big concerns was, will those big bolts who have been on that vessel since 2001 unscrew? And can we put this new thing on? And I was actually in Houston when the videos were on that that uh, that very bottom part in the in, in on location, and they just unscrewed. It was like amazing. So um, <laughs> you know, so they actually replaced it with this capping stack where it was actually you could actually uh, cut off all the oil. Okay. Um, and so that's when a lot of the science team's work really kicked into action. Um, and the, we, we, we started what was called the well integrity test. We had to talk a long time about whether or not it was worth, it was, it, it, we could shut the well in with this capping stack. Uh, but we allowed that and oil stopped flowing on July 15th, although everyone was, com was seriously nervous about doing this step. Okay. Now, this is diagram is very boring looking, um, but you've seen it probably in the newspapers. It's actually the schematic of the casing, the pipe that actually formed the well. And it's, as Malcolm mentioned, the bottom of it is eight, about 18,000 feet below the surface. Now, in this particular, I'll, I'll come back to the point about complexity. The outer pipes are pipes that are slotted into each other in the gray part of the cement that tries to make the whole thing one single piece. Because you want to have it one single piece. If you don't have one single piece, then oil will come shooting out the sides. So the, the reason that this is so important is because deep water wells all have a lot of pieces because of that pressure issue I told you about. So a shallow water well would have three casings, for example. This has at least nine. And all those connections are just like connections in any pipe. They can fail. So what we were analyzing, and we insisted that the BP actually begin to monitor the wellhead, because we were afraid that there was oil coming out, for example, at that breach in the mid casing. And if that had happened, you could begin to form seeps that would be uncontrollable and very, very difficult to stop. Uh, even worse than uh, from, from the center of this well bore. So we, they, they, they ran seismics. We know what we brought in NOAA ships to monitor the wellhead to, to be sure there was no gas coming through out, out the top. And this went on for, for several weeks. OK, Bob. So after, after that work was, was, was going on and we established that there was pretty good well integrity, um, the, the data that was able to be collected in the wellhead with that new capping stack, not only did the information that Peter's group had worked on to estimate the flow rates, but Secretary Chu's team had insisted that the capping stack get installed with measurement devices, pressure transducers at various locations. <coughs> and as we went through this, the closing of the wellhead, we could use those measurements to actually get a better estimate of flow rate. And they were consistent with some of the other measurements that were made. So this new flow rate, which is about 5 million barrels released with a fairly big t uh, percentage area, really is a, probably the best estimate we have now. And I think it's going to be the best estimate for, for quite a while. OK. After that, um, the well was still under pressure and flowing. It was just sealed at the top. Uh, there was another series of meetings to discuss whether or not we should kill the well from the top. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that took uh, several weeks of analysis. And that actually was approved and was successful. And everyone was quite relieved. And the cementing of the casing, the inner part of the casing, occurred on August 5th. OK? Um, after that, uh, there was also discussion about whether or not to take off that old 
dirty broken b o p and put a new one on and that was approved and it was successfully done on september fourth <coughs> okay and then, as you've probably heard, the relief well uh, was successful, and I can talk about details of this, but there's different aspects of the well that were killed and cemented um, after the, uh, the, the top kill was completed. Okay. So that was kind of the whirlwind of what the wellhead work was, was done. Um, mainly BP did all of that work, but it was under the guidance of um, Admiral Allen approved everything, but it was under the guidance of Secretary Two's science team. So let me just talk about the lessons learned. Okay. <coughs> okay. The, this um, is a, just a, a cartoon showing you the amount of engineering and work that was done to cap this well. There were so many vessels, big, large vessels, um, in this in this arena, and there were basically three. Thank you. There were three main um, campaigns, two relief wells that all had their own support systems, and then the oil recovery and intervention, where they're actually containing the oil, burning it off, sometimes doing some surface burning early on. And they all had to work in a very smaller area. And when we asked uh, them to monitor the wellhead when we were doing the well integrity test, it took an incredible amount of coordination in order to, to allow additional vessels in, because it was extremely dangerous to work so to have vessels working so closely together, so I have got to give hats off to the simultaneous operations leadership in this campaign. It was tremendous that that not only was there such a great response from the government, but the industry uh, leadership in maintaining an, a safe environment and no accidents happened because of this congestion was remarkable, truly remarkable. Okay. And this is just a picture of it. Uh, that's just one, one part. You can see uh, all the vessels working in a small area. Okay. And this is what a cartoon of what it looks like underwater. It wasn't just the surface vessels. There were many, many remotely operated vehicles, large ones, working on all kinds of operations simultaneously. And so, as Chris mentioned, just getting another vessel in there with another line and another instrument could have caused major damage to any of the important, all of the are important operations, but any of the operations that were happening to delicately do some of the things you needed to do at the wellhead. Okay. So from, from my perspective, the lessons learned here are several, and one of them is clearly that our regulatory environment requires revision. And there's no, that, that's very clear, and that, that I think the President, Secretary Salazar, clearly understood that, and that work is going on right now. There's three commissions working on looking at the events of this of this uh, oil spill, and those results will help shape our regulatory environment in the future. I think in, I was I was uh, actually honored to be working on Secretary Chu's team, and from my perspective, that team was almost an ad hoc type of approval system, and as Peter mentioned, almost an arm's length one where you you actually the industry pro proposes a, an approach and an independent group evaluates it, asks hard questions, and that dialogue actually helps to make the event safer. Um, I think it's clear that true deep water drilling is very risk, not very risky, but it has increased risk and requires complex designs that will require um, a much more sophisticated regulatory approach. Every single well is different, even one right next to the other. They're not the same. Um, the, and, and the, the pictures I just showed you was an, an amazing response by, by BP uh, in, in collaboration with uh, the U.S. government, where they really stood up a very rapid containment system. Um, and industry now has a consortium they've formed, a company that's been formed nonprofit led by ExxonMobil, and they've already invested $1 billion. And that cartoon on the right really is what they're, they're actually beginning to build as an industry-based containment system that could work at similar, I think it's up to 10,000 feet water depth, to actually have this, these, these pieces that BP actually built on the fly ready for any kind of uh, next disaster. In terms of the other lessons learned, I think we have to wait for the commission's uh, uh, results. The president has a commission that is now um, has hearings going on 
if you're interested, they're all online on C-SPAN. Very interesting, uh, interesting testimony. The uh, Coast Guard and the Department of Homeland Security are conducting a hearing, uh, a, a commission as well, investigating the actual um, failure of the of the well and the and the, the the what went wrong to cause that oil spill. And the National Research Council has a, a, a basically a commission looking at both the regulatory and the and the uh, problems that happened uh, at, at this uh, at this event. Okay. So I can leave that slide up for questions and comments. Great. Thank you, Kate. All right, if we could get the house lights back up. Um, it is uh, 8.30 by the company clock. Uh, we had initially scheduled time for uh, panel discussion, but in, 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 in light of the lateness of the hour, I'd like to propose opening the floor uh, to you and putting a fixed time of closing at 8.45 on the company clock. And if people would have further questions, they're welcome to come down here and talk to the panel members after that. So we'll take about 15 minutes of questions and answers. And uh, I'll happily, uh, Admiral Landry is back on screen to join us. And I'll happily take the uh, first question. Sir, and back. I'm going to repeat the question so that the webcast can hear what's going on. Yes, sir. So the question is, why was not why is it not being called a major contamination event? Would anyone like to uh, handle that one, Chris? At this point, it's semantics with the, the video and the TV and media that exists right now. And the last thing we can really care about is spill leak. Everybody's seen how much oil is out there. It's a disaster. So to me, spill leak it's synonymous with oil that shouldn't be there. It's an uninvited guest. Uh, I, I think that's semantics. Of course, the grand. Okay, we're not we're not going to engage in argumentation though. So, Kate, did you have a comment? I gladly would. Yeah, well, no, we're no. It's, no, there's there's a question, there's an answer, but the, the, we won't get into a debate. Kate or David? Sorry, David. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Chris in that when I was um, testifying in front of the in front of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, it was very clear. One half of the committee, the uh, majority half, described it as. A And I thought that was really politicizing uh, the fact oil is coming out of the ground. And what we call it, I don't think really matters. Okay. Uh, sir, here. Well, if you recall, when I was discussing the potential dollar amounts here, uh, the issue of whether or not a safety regulation was violated, if, uh, remember, those are, those are allegations. This has all got to be proven if that's what actually happened. If, and I've all, we've all seen the 60 Minutes show where people said that's what happened and so on. But, you know, it takes some vetting of those facts to make sure they're accurate. If they are accurate, then uh, certainly, you can certainly make the case under the Oil Pollution Act that this is not simple negligence, that, that it does rise to the level of uh, criminal negligence and the potential for punitive damages. But that's an area that, believe me, uh, is, is part of the criminal aspect of the case the U.S. Attorney is concentrating on very hard. Other questions? Uh, sir, Steve. Well, I guess I'm one of the feds that shouldn't be in charge of things down there, but I did, I did work this bill all summer, and uh, as an alumnus of Texas A&M, another university that does a little bit of work, I've got to say thank God for the University of Rhode Island. This is the first really objective and, in my opinion, accurate assessment down there across the board on the panel that I've been at since the time since 
since the beginning of summer when I was doing a bunch of open houses down there, a bunch of scientific meetings. But my question really has to do with whether or not the panel is well, I've given any thought to historically how this will be looked at in terms of the resilience of the Gulf, if that'll be part of the legacy of this, and the impact of the way the press handled this event on the economic impact that ultimately becomes the reality. Okay, so there's two questions for those on the webcast. The, uh, the resiliency of the Gulf of Mexico long term, and I think the kind of research questions that David was addressing. Uh, and the second one was uh, the issue of the press handling of the coverage uh, because it did perhaps exacerbate the economic impacts on the Gulf of Mexico. And to put a plug in for the Grantham Prize Award ceremony Friday afternoon, that is exactly the subject of the panel discussion Friday afternoon, how the press handled uh, this particular incident. Uh, so uh, who'd like to handle the first one? Chris? I'm going to just ask, I'm going to add one more question and let the panelists ask is, I actually think the bigger problem was actually scientists. And there were so-called eminent oceanographers who were saying statements like, everybody in the world is going to be affected by the Gulf spill. Um, the Gulf's going to be dead for four decades. And when you're down in Houma, Louisiana, people are asking you as a scientist at the coffee shop whether they should sell your house because they heard an eminent oceanographer say that. An eminent oceanographer who's never would know the difference between phenanthrene and, and benzene. That's troubling. And that, I think, is a bigger problem is that we had some scientists that actually were then, then magnified by the press. So uh, I, I will leave it to my opinion. Uh, David, you, did you want to come in on that as well? I uh, thought I saw you. Yeah, we can look at the oil spill. Uh, David, you, did you want to come in? <laughs> you done? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think we can look to the uh, x stock one spill, which occurred in 79, 1979, so that's a good 30 years, a little over 30 years. Um, there were immediate impacts. Some of the people, uh, we're looking at changes in the bacterial community that looked at uh, those that could degrade carbon and uh, de degrade the oil, and they their populations did increase over time, and then they relaxed back. I think it's it's hard pressed to find uh, uh, real evidence of, of that spill now, 31 years later. Which you know you can you can put your own value on that time scale there, but but certainly it's it's a uh, a large impact right now, a large impact on the local communities that, that should not be underestimated. But I think 30 years from now, we're going to look back and, and, and it'll be hard for us to find, find evidence of this, of this bill. Uh, yes, Nancy. So the question is, I guess, about the moratorium. What, what is the potential for reopening uh, further drilling in very deep water? Um, and I'll turn that one over to Kate. <laughs> First, I'd like to say that I'm here as a professor. <laughs> um, but there are discussions going on right now and, and, and reviewing that question. Um, last week, uh, uh, last Wednesday in Washington, Secretary Chu and Secretary Salazar uh, held a, a meeting uh, with industry where they reviewed uh, in, op in a public forum that containment system that I talked about at, at the end of my, my presentation. And, and that's part, they're, they're trying to review uh, all of these things that could allow them to lift the moratorium. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not in on those decision making, uh, those decisions, but I can tell you that everyone is actively looking at that now because there are economic issues and you want to make decisions that are sensible. So I don't know the end result, but certainly all of those details are being looked at very carefully. Could I just add one thing about the long-term risk? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that's happening, as you probably know, um, Secretary Mabus has been instructed to lead an effort in the government to, to develop a plan for restoring the goal. That's relatively short-lived, but we're also trying to work with the agencies in our office to have a longer-term plan. And we, 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 no decisions have yet been made, but we're, we're identifying a ten, at least a 10-year window seems to be a sensible window to actually look at the impacts over that time frame. The complicated part we're going to have, as most of you know, um, is that we're also going undergoing climate change and, and also issues associated with the Gulf of Mexico that are re not related to climate change but related to the actual control of the Mississippi River. So these are not going to be easy problems to solve, but, that, that's, but 
I think everyone's going in with their eyes wide open to try to understand this as best as possible. Thank you, Kate. This one, yes, sir. So the question is, uh, with the, uh, the rig itself essentially evidence in terms of what happened at the time, uh, is anyone aware of the time frame for raising the rig? Uh, admiral Landry is trying to answer that one, so I'm going to turn that, I'm going to turn that over to the admiral. Mary? Okay. Let me re repeat the question, Mary. The uh, the issue is when do you think the uh, oil rig will be raised uh, to assist in the criminal investigation uh, at the time? Well, it was working so well, Bob. She said three weeks. She said three weeks? She better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. Well, the the system worked beautifully. Uh, Mary, if you can hear me, your microphone is off now. Yeah. The bottom line is, it's really unlikely. <laughs> Well, as as you as as you know, it's a it's a it's a massive structure, and the idea. Okay, Dennis, can you hear me now? Yes. It's on now. Can you hear me, Dennis? Can you hear me, Dennis? Okay. Uh, on the. All right. I'm sorry. On whether or not they're going to raise the risk. As you know, it's 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 a massive structure. And the idea. Not, we're not sure if they're going to raise the rig or not. That's, that hasn't been addressed, but there has been chain of custody on the BOP itself, and that's been brought ashore. Um, the other issue that Chris Reddy mentioned about the press, I think we do have to examine uh, the national dialogue issue on how we manage information in the 24-7 media, social media era. Uh, the training I had for H5N1, you know, a, a real serious pandemic says that you have to have alignment of messaging from federal to, to local across the board so that you don't cause more problems than you have with the existing crisis. I honestly think, and I'm not criticizing necessarily the media, but we try to be transparent with this and forthright with information, a very, very robust website, uh, pushing information out all the time. And I really think there was this gotcha, you know, we've got to have the story. Let me give you one example. Uh, Anderson Cooper, keeping him honest, he said to uh, parish president, will you please, please bring me an angry offshore worker uh, who's been affected by the moratorium? And the parish president said, how about if I just bring you an offshore worker? And he said, well, if he doesn't come with his anger, I really don't need him on my show. And I think that, that kind of hysteria and serious, these people were tremendously stressed already. And to continue to exacerbate the situation further, I don't think helps anybody. And then the other issue of, you know, we've got a terrible oil spill, but we, they want you, the governors want you to report the beaches are fine. Please come down and tourists partake in our, um, our um, you know, recreational activities. I think we were struggling with all of that. So that alignment of messaging and getting everybody to understand how important it is to have fair and balanced reporting to manage us through the crisis was a very big challenge. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, yes, sir. This is for Chris. What is the current status of the seafood industry in the the, the, the question is, what, what's the current status of the seafood industry in the Gulf? Or I believe the Gulf has been reopened. Chris? No, I think, no, piece by piece, they are opening up different areas. Um, uh, but the, the Gulf as a whole has not been completely reopened. It, it is a huge issue. The government has eat, swim, fish. I think that's the, the three things that you're trying to keep in mind. And they're certainly trying to open up these fisheries as soon as possible. But it's 
it's not completely, but they certainly are incrementally as as prudently as possible. And prudence wins over urgency. At this point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. The hydrates. Yeah, and uh, methane mm -hmm. is in there. Has, has this been quantified or I mean, now you're concerned about measuring yet another thing, and what is the likely number of the effect on, uh, if this is a greenhouse gas? Dennis? Yes. If you can hear me, Dennis? Yes. Hydrates. <laughs> Okay. Dennis, um, the FDA, Dr. Hamburg, came down, and I hope I'm not interrupting anybody, but um, actually did a lot of work to expand the capacity for seafood testing, working with the states and making sure they went from so many labs to increase the capacity. So there's been, you know, millions of dollars signed off to make sure not only do we have seafood testing and sampling, but we also have, you know, all the great science that's going on in the Gulf now. So that's a huge investment that's being made to build the confidence of the people that, that we will provide rigorous oversight of the status of the fisheries and the status of the Gulf itself uh, to inform people. And the fisheries are being opened in a very methodical manner using that science. Thank you, Mary. We'll take one last question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. So the gas fraction is being examined. It is an important aspect that's been overlooked. And there's a lot of scientists addressing that uh, on, a, on a volume basis, it's 300 times more gas on the tabletop than there is oil. Um, and it's being considered and worked on. Several papers have already been published on it. So. There, I, I can have, there are microorganisms that oxidize the methane that we use as an energy source. And methane is seeping out all the time. And most of it uh, is oxidized in the water column as well as it gets through, through the air. Who's getting hit first is propane, which is uh, propane getting eaten. Uh, that's, this really is the last question. Yes, sir. If it went from mission in the ground to reopen uh, the operating rigs in the Gulf, how So the question is how difficult it is to come back online. Uh, Kate, you've had actual drilling experience. Uh, how difficult should this be? Um, well, my understanding is that um, the number of, of rigs that were actually affected by the, by the uh, moratorium uh, was a number like 33. And a couple of them, at least, were rigs that hadn't yet arrived in the Gulf. They're still being completed in, in shipyards uh, far, far afield from the Gulf of Mexico. And many, I was actually down there about a week and a half ago and visited a rig that was basically on standby, uh, operated by Shell uh, in really deep water. And um, they, they are actually, uh, let me back up, I think because of the fact that the government has been very transparent about their intentions, um, they, uh, they were taking that rig and, and doing some maintenance and using that time to upgrade facilities that they had been waiting to do. And many of the rigs are doing that. So I actually think this is, this is not a firm analysis, but I think that the, that the, that the work could, could spin up fairly quickly. All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our panelists here tonight for a great job. I would. Uh, I'd like to thank the. Uh, Division of University Advancement for hosting this event for us tonight. And uh, particular thanks to Bob Sand for making all this complex stuff actually work here tonight. Thanks very much. <laughs>